something feels off about ChatGPT's writing. I couldn't quite pinpoint it until I saw this tweet. It has a certain vibe, like it was written by a golden retriever. Now, I am a tech-savvy Gen Xer, but if I'm honest with you, I've been struggling to incorporate ChatGPT into my workflow. So I turned to one of my dear friends, an AI savant, Dan Shipper, the founder of the business publication, Every, and asked him to show me what I was really missing. We're just at this like really amazing era in history where we were all just given these magical powers. Like you and I, we can code, you know, even if we can't code. I needed Dan to coach me on the different models. Like, did you know Claude is better for writing? Or Facebook has this thing called Llama. And he made it very clear that as a leader, I needed to reimagine what AI looks like at an organization level. I think we're like moving from a knowledge economy where you're compensated based on what you know to an allocation economy where you're compensated based on how well you can allocate at intelligence. This conversation blew my mind. It was like having a personal trainer for AI. Before we jump in, maybe AI is going to take us to that promised land where we can work on whatever we want. But until then, we've got a group coaching program for high-performing, ambitious professionals looking to make a bold career pivot so that they can follow their purpose and spend time with the people they love most. If that's you, check out radreads.co slash coaching. Now here's my AI coaching session with Dan Shipper. I primed the pump with Dan before we hit record. And I said, I have this feeling that in my own world, AI feels like a solution in search of a problem. And uh, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was pissed. And, and there was like a, like a, puff, like it was, it was like, it was like spit into his mic when I, when I said that. Can I, can I backtrack on it? Um, because I, I mean, I, there, it's out there. So like, not really, but you can try. Okay. <laughs> I, okay, I, won't, I won't backtrack, I, I, but I do want to share because I suspect our listeners are Fortune 500 types, corporate execs, a lot of Wall Street lawyers, um, probably some big tech, MBA students. You, you know the type, Dan. They're, they're, yeah. they're kind of the typical every reader with probably slightly less of a tech bent. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I kind of force myself to use ChatGPT every day, kind of like a, a little bit of a gym of sorts. Um, so I have it open. It's ChatGPT is the only one that I use. I'm, I'm going to break down for, for my readers um, how I use it. So the first the most salient way that I used ChatGPT at the outset was basically as a um, subset, a, a, a replacement for search. Uh, and so my most common question to ChatGPT is, how do I make the fluffiest pancakes? And by the <laughs> way, according to my daughters, they delivered. Uh, they were the fluffiest pancakes ever. You know, I have the, the mantle of having some of the best pancakes they've ever eaten, thanks to ChatGPT. I love that. The next place that I use ChatGPT is, um, I would say, as kind of a brainstorming partner for my writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually it is much more for framing ideas and specifically coming up with headlines. So things that are pretty contained, like come up with 10 YouTube video titles, come up with mm -hmm. 10 blog post titles, use this word, don't use this word, keep trying. So, but it's very contained. And so I use it regularly for these like very kind of short, discrete brainstorming sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and then the most exciting way that I've most recently used ChatGPT is I power, I uh, supplement it with fireflies.ai, which is kind of a note-taking app for all of my Zoom calls. And I basically, you know, I have different threads open. So I might have one with a, with a client, like let's say Dan's a client. So every conversation, I take a transcript, I dump it into to uh to chat gpt like a running thread and i'm like hey what was the thing dan was struggling with in the first session mm -hmm. or sometimes if i'm feeling a little freaky i'd be like if i were to write a blog post about dan's problems like how would what would be the most interesting topic right so i do that for like individual clients and probably the most powerful one is i run all my prospect like my prospecting calls through that same mm -hmm. thread mm -hmm. and then i'll ask it like rank the occurrence of problem what problem occurs more frequently so it's kind of like a little bit of a marketing assistant, and sometimes I'll ask it for for ideas, but mostly it's, I use it more for for recall. Like, what was the thing Dan said, or what was the thing Joe said? And and sometimes someone warned me, like, be careful of hallucinations there, because like you know Dan said he was unhappy with uh, his job, and it turned out that was a hallucination. That might be a bad thing to like act mm -hmm. upon. And that really is it. 
And so I saw the, oh, and the last one is like, we do customer surveys. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have like a bunch of type forms and I'll just dump in like these Excel downloads of like these surveys that end up like main pain points. I mean, a lot of kind of market, there's a lot of marketing research based on text that our customers give us. So I'll stop there. It sounds like you've got a lot of great use cases for it. I'm I'm kind of curious why you think that it doesn't solve a problem for you. <laughs> well, here, here's here's where I would say it doesn't solve a problem for me. Is I ask myself if if someday you woke up and you're like you can't have Chat GPT anymore. I don't think mm. I'd be that sad. Mm. I think for the writing, I think it's a nice to have, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm asking it to really refine, like go the last two percent of something that I'm probably pretty good at to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think with this kind of understand this like conversation about prospects, I feel like if this continues to act as it, um, as it's been acting so far in like six months, um, it might cross over to the point like, oh man, I can't imagine what life would be like if I couldn't just be like, remind me what these people are struggling with, what, what, remind me what these prospects are struggling with. It was just like that conversational nature, especially as it, it accumulates real, real life, life um, data. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've really wanted it to do that I, I've struggled with is I thought ChatGPT would be like the perfect place like to take a, an essay that I'd written and, and, and feed it like, like 10 LinkedIn style, you know, the LinkedIn broetry style, you know, one sentence staccato writing. So yeah. I fed it like 10 staccato LinkedIn and I'm like, make my post like, like the summary of that. I've struggled like beyond generating very short bursts of text, like a headline, a, a framing or so on. I've really struggled with the like fully generated element. Last thing I'll say, it's not chat GPT. Mid journey, we have replaced all of our art with mid journey art. And that's really cool. But again, if you took mid-journey away from me, I would go back to like clip art, un unsplash clip art. Like it wouldn't be the end of the world. Yeah. So uh, there's, I have a lot of things to say, but I think one, one sort of important thing is, especially for someone like you who, um, I think you have a team, but it's very, it's small, just like, just yep, like mine. Very small. And the things that you say that you're having AI do, they're not full jobs yet. But mm -hmm. to get someone to do that at like a really like at a really high level, like headlines or customer feedback or whatever, like either you have to spend your time on it or you have to hire someone to do that. And that's quite expensive. Um, yep. And um, I, I think what you what you're what it sounds like you're finding right now is you're it's making you at least somewhat more efficient at those jobs yep. or. Um, you could actually probably hand those jobs off to someone else on your team, even if they currently don't have the skills to do it as well as you want them to. So like finding mm -hmm. headlines or um, summarizing uh, summarizing customer feedback or whatever. Uh, so uh, you're sort of getting to this place where um, these new powers are sort of starting to sprout for you and for the other people mm -hmm. that, that work for you. And I think that that will, that will continue as you... Um, as you learn to do it more and as the models get better. And yeah. I think that will create a situation where you have a lot more leverage yourself and for your team to do lots of lots more things than you, than you could do before. And I can, I can give you lots of examples of how that works yeah. for us every, um, but the, the, the thing that you said, um, that struck me that I think you should, you should look at is, um, specifically having it right for you, uh, specifically mm -hmm. turning, um, uh, turning your essays into LinkedIn posts it can really do that, but you shouldn't use ChatGPT for that. You should use Claude. Uh, um, okay. And I think one of the one of the really important things to mm. be aware of in AI land is you sort of have to maintain this um, sense of curiosity and, exper and an experimental attitude because mm -hmm. uh, these models change really frequently. And so if you've tried something a year ago or six months ago or three months ago, um, it might be different now. And I think Got as it. humans, like we just sort of develop what I've been calling like capability blindness. Like we don't want to like turn the same rock over twice. So if you've tried it once and it didn't work, yeah. like we're just like, well, that's not like that's not worth it yeah. or whatever. Um, and uh, and and especially like I think this is 100 percent true for anyone working a corporate job or just anyone who's really busy. like. 
you know, my job is to cover this stuff. So like, of course I get to be curious about it. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Um, but you always have to, you always have to make this like trade, um, in your day to day between like getting a task done in a no, in the way that I already do it, that I know will work, but will, but will cost me time. And, uh, the other option is to like use AI and it may not work. And then I will have like wasted an hour on it and I will still have the same to-do list. And like, that's never fun. Like I don't want to do that, you know? Um, and so I think learning to figure out how to allow yourself the time and space to experiment with these things frequently, um, and Mm -hmm. being okay with wasting a little bit of time, uh, if you want to be on the sort of early adopter curve, which I think is a quite valuable place to be is, is really important. And I I agree the way that I think about this is I think it's a little bit like, um, what happens when you become a manager for the first time? Um, I was just thinking of that. So like when you're managing humans for the first time, what people often do is um, they always have to make, you always have to make this choice between I have a task um, and I can either do it myself and get it done right, or I can delegate it. But if I delegate it, then it may not be done the way that I want it to be done. And then I'm going to, then I'll waste time. And so um, early managers end up either not delegating and then never getting any leverage from their employees or over delegating and then getting back work that isn't good. Um, yeah. And so the like the task of a skilled human manager is to know how to scope and size the tasks that you have and cut it into small little micro tasks, know which resource yeah. um, you need to give the task to, mm-hmm. and then also know when to get into the details and when to let it be fully de- delegated so you can get as much leverage from the, the people you have working for you as you possibly can. Um, And I think being a model manager, which I think we all are becoming model managers, is a lot like that. Um, Yeah. You have to know um, what tasks, like when you, if you have a big task, you have to be able to split it up into subtasks. You have to know which resource, which model is going to be best for which task. You have to know how to give it to that model in a way that they can do it. And then you have to know when to be suspicious, when to get into the details, when to think, okay, maybe this hallucinator, maybe it didn't. Um, And if you can do that really effectively, you can get a lot more leverage on your work than, than you could before. But I think people get kind of caught in, in sort of feeling like, okay, like I can just hand it my, hand it this stuff and it will just do it on its own. And it's like, even humans can't do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. um, And then you give up right away. I'm like, you can, I guess it's very rare. Yeah. Like if if you have hired people, you know that it's really rare to find anyone who can just do a job perfectly um, without you having to explain very much. And if okay. you do find that person, you hire them immediately and you keep them forever. And yeah. AI is certainly not at that level. It's more like intern to like first year uh, analyst type level. Um, and that's really valuable if you know how to use it appropriately. Um, yeah. But but that's sort of the, that's that. the way I, the, I think about it. I love that. And I think, you know, one thing right out the gate, one thing that that you surprised me. So I, su- I suspect will surprise our other listeners is like, I just assume they were all the same, it's like Nike versus Adidas, right? It like if you need to play soccer, you could use either one, right? And there might be like little changes at the margins, but you're not going to be a different soccer player whether you play Nike with a Nike shoe or an Adidas shoe. So that was kind of mistake number one. As I just bucket, I'm just like, ah, I have a Chat GPT. I paid for premium. Like I don't need Claude. I, I had Claude yeah. once, so like I don't need I don't need Claude. And so, and then the second thing you said, you have to be a managed. I mean, first of all. The analogy of uh, it's it, you're so right on right where I have to convert this post to this this writing style to this writing style. I try it once and I'm like this thing's this thing doesn't work. It can't do it. And then I just <laughs> give up and I like I like write, wrote it off. I'm like you can't do this. I like this thing sucks. Problem well, solution in search of a problem. <laughs> so I, I do think that you know the the manager. It, it's actually it's a little hard for me to grok thinking of the model as an employee. Like I don't know if it's the you know what is it called like uh like how folder like the folder icon looks like a folder it's like <laughs> the uh, uh skeuomorphicity i think um mm-hmm. it like i'm like no it's not a it's not a person it's a it's like a thing you know yeah. and, and but like thinking that so there's a there's two shifts there right like they're they're kind of like like people maybe at this point would it be helpful uh because i'm going to use you a bit as a as a coach and maybe like i already shared like the types of people listening to this is it helpful to say, like you said, well, Claude, use Claude for writing. Is there a way to think of the current toolkit of like, this one's for writing, this one's for coding, this one's for yeah. math. 
How does how does the landscape break down at a like ten thousand foot view? Very high level. I think the ChatGPT um, is like sort of the best overall general purpose model. Um, that doesn't mean it's the smartest, but it's the best overall general purpose model. Um, specifically because it is among the smartest models, um, and I think it has uh, the best. Uh, sort of consumer facing user experience. So they have okay. little things that make it really easy to do, like um, easy easy to use in a powerful way. Like they have uh, a memory feature. They have, um, so it remembers who you are and what you've told it. Mm -hmm. That's have, new, right? That's new. Newish. But I, I've yep. been using it for a while, but, uh, but it just okay. came out um, publicly. They have a, a little way to edit previous messages, which is really cool, and scroll through different versions of your chat history, which is really cool. So you can sort of like branch your chat in 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 really interesting ways. Uh, they have you could go back in and then like start a new chat. Okay, exactly. I didn't even know that. <laughs> they have a really good mobile experience. Um, they have a really good voice to text transcription and really good yep. ability to like talk to it and have it talk back to you, which is really cool. So there's a lot of just nice like quality of life Got things it. that make it good. Sounds like an Apple product. So to yeah, speak. a little bit, uh, sort of, sort of like that. Um, and then I think also ChatGPT is just the best uh, programming assistant. Um, okay. I I use it the most for programming, and also Claude, which I think is the overall probably smartest model right now. Um, mm. They have usage limits, and so okay. it just like even if you pay for it, you get limited, and like that sucks. Uh, um, okay. So I use ChatGPT for programming. Uh, I think Claude, like I said, best best writer. Um, I think it can um, basically mimic my style like seventy percent. So wow. the value of Claude is like for those kinds of tasks that I'm doing repetitively, like I'm turning a podcast into a tweet, which I do all the time. Like I have, I mean, I, I first I started with a prompt that would do that, and it got me to seventy yep. percent, and now. Um, I built an internal tool that we use um, for all of these tasks where you can like save that. So I have a, it's called a spiral and we, I have a little spiral where it's podcast to Dan, Dan tweet. And uh, oh, wow. we have a writer in at, at every who her name is Rhea. She's really talented who um, does these. So what she does is she will start by taking a podcast transcript, pasting it into spiral. It will send it to Claude. Claude will transform it into a tweet and then she will spend a little bit of time editing it and then I will edit it. And that wow. gets her that gets her to like seventy percent. So Ooh. it's like pretty much on the rails. And then by the time I see it, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, and, and then you like might really... change a word or two. Exactly. To make, yeah. So that's really uh, cool. Um, you call it spiral, spiral, spiral. Yeah, spiral. And it, does yeah. that require um, coding expertise to create a spiral? No. Or no? Oh. oh well. So I built the app, and so that requires oh, okay. programming experience. But the spiral. Once it's, now that it's built, anyone can make one and, and convert Got things it. like podcast transcripts to tweets or whatever. Cool. Oh, Spiral is something you, you made. Yeah. Cool. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Very um, cool. So yeah, it's a, it's a little internal tool we use, which is, which is very cool. And so, yeah, so I think Claude, Claude is really a really good writer. It also has a very large context window. So uh, the context window is the amount of text that you could fit into a prompt. Um, oh, yeah. I always and, split mine on ChatGPT. I do the yes. long prompt splitter. Yeah. So, so Claude has like, I think it's like 200 pages worth of context. Maybe it's 200 to 300. So you can wow. put an entire book in there and ask it questions about the book. And it's like actually quite good at asking oh. questions, summarizing, compressing, all that kind of stuff. Can you do a PDF or you need like the actual RTF file of the book? Uh, you can do a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I wow. think that there's like a 10 megabyte limit or something like that. Like it's a pretty yeah. low limit on the file size, but you could convert the PDF to text and that gives you Got a lot it. more. Um, so that's really good. Uh, it's really, it's really good for that. And then, um, I think Gemini, which is Google's model has the largest context oh. window, which is like a million and a half, um, tokens, um, okay. which is, that's a, that's a lot. Like you can put it in there. Got yeah. it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so that's really good. And the last one is llama three, which just came out from meta and that's the open source one that anyone okay. can, um, can modify, um, or, or fine tune and down, just literally down, down to their computer and, and use. And I think particularly for enterprises that have data that they want to keep themselves and want to have their own Got models, Llama is a really good starting point. Got it. Got it. What would be, so it's ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, slash Google, Llama, slash Meta yeah. are kind of the four four in LLMs, large language models. What's the special, you, you mentioned the large uh, file size um, for Gemini. Any other strengths like Gemini versus 
Claude or that's the big one. Like the the big context window is actually like really cool. Like you could feed it, um, you could feed it a, a a video of you and have it like find all of the different shirt colors that you were wearing in each section of the video or whatever. And oh, wow. just, like, I'll put a list, you know, like, and that's, that's a useless example. Cause I just made it up, but like, yeah. there's a lot of stuff you can do if, uh, if you if you can feed a language model, like a video and have it annotated or pull out patterns or whatever. Got it. Got it. So you can, wow. So you can put in like, so you could put in a movie and, and say like, what are the 10 best quotes? Yeah. from this movie or the 10 most violent scenes or yeah. something like that. Exactly. Got um, it. Probably can't do an entire movie yet, but like you can put Got in it. a significant chunk of movie. Yeah. I'm wondering as a knowledge worker, do you think that like putting in, I don't know, like videos of, of panelists at a conference and kind of using that, like I, what, what I would do is I would probably like, let's say there was like a long talk um, at a conference and I don't want, I just want to, to ask it questions, I would probably strip the transcript out of the video using Descript, or there's probably a much faster way to do it. But I'd basically get the transcript and then I would dump it into GPT. Uh, so like with Google, you could just give it the, the TED Talk and be like, give me like the 10 most moving moments in this TED Talk, yeah. things like that. Yeah, exactly. Basically um, bypassing the step. Is there some value in the, because at the end, like my mind goes like video to words, then get the words. But is is that the right frame? Like, do you want to like stay video to to video? If if you know what my what I mean by that question, I don't think so. I think what you might mean is is there so in in one world you're like you're taking the video and turning it into a transcript and then feeding the transcript into a language model and asking questions about the transcript versus exactly, yeah um On a skate, uh, versus questions this video, directly about the video like asking questions directly of the video. There is value actually. So. Mm. What's really interesting is when you feed something into like a a, a transcription model, um, maybe it's video to text, maybe it's like handwriting recognition. A lot of times those models are, they're not actually thinking about the meaning of the words um, that are being spoken. They're just like, um, for example, for a handwriting recognition te text, they're just like looking at the, at literally the, like the cool. shape of the character Got and it. for a pattern. Exactly. And so that's, uh, that's good, but often like it, think about how you read handwriting or how you understand what someone says at a conference. If they were like, if it's a yeah. little bit, if their handwriting is messy or it's like a little bit, uh, less audible, um, mm -hmm. you, you fill in what you think is there yeah. based on the context clues. Like what are they likely yeah. to have said? And like, are so, they smiling or body language? Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. Or like, what do they just say? What do they just say before? What's the topic of the, of the talk, for example, <laughs> will help you understand like, what's the word they said that you can't quite figure out. And yeah. so transcription models that are not, that are sort of unbundled from language models, um, don't know any of that. And so they will fail more often because they only have the kind of like character level oh, recognition. Got it. Um, but when you bundle it into language models, it, you, you're, you're, both doing the conversion from text to video um, mm -hmm. and you have all the context, all the semantic meaning of like what has been said, what are they talking about? So yeah. it helps create better transcriptions and thus better answers to questions. Got it. Got it. You mentioned something about uploading a book. And so one thing I've been using again with ChatGPT is I'll ask it, do you know uh, No Bad Parts by Dick Schwartz? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, summarize the top, the first 10 chapters, summarize each chapter for me. Then they'll give me chapters and then I'm like, you, they might say something about uh, the taskmaster part. I'm like, tell me more about the taskmaster part. Mm -hmm. Is the taskmaster part? So I'll like ask it questions just like based on, I'll kind of like read the book for yeah. the highlights of the book through ChatGPT. It's actually pretty helpful because I don't want to read a lot of nonfiction books. I just want to kind of ex extract the core ideas mm -hmm. and interact with it. Is this kind of, you'd mentioned you could download a book, upload a book into uh, Claude or the, yeah. like the bigger window. Like what, let, let's say I asked, like we were using the book No Bad Part. So I ask mm -hmm. ChatGPT to summarize or I buy a copy of the book, upload the PDF to Claude. How different, and I ask it this, I have the same interactions. Like yeah. how different is the quality of that interactions? Is that even worth discussing, measurable? 
Yeah, it's going to be very different. Um, so very if different. you give it the text, it's going to be very different than if it doesn't have the text. Um, okay. It'll like ChatGPT will or Claude doesn't matter the model. It will perform okay if it's a popular book, even if it doesn't have the text. But you're much more likely to run into um, hallucinations. Um, uh, and so, and the reason for that is you can kind of think of um, just saying like summarize the book, no bad parts from I, don't, I can't remember, Dick Schwartz. Dick Schwartz. You can kind of think of that as, um, and this is a new metaphor, so tell me if this doesn't make any sense. We'll, we'll unpack it together. But you can kind of think of it as like the that question is a little bit like an acorn. It's like an acorn okay. that's going to grow into a tree, right? Okay. And the model has to grow that tree, that entire tree for you. Um, okay. So you've given it like a little plan in the acorn. So you're like, I want what I want is this summary. Here's the plan, and then the model okay. has to like basically take that plan and just like do as much as it possibly can to like fill that out. And it's going to try to do that in any way it possibly can. Got it. And any given acorn, like depending on all the conditions and under which it's grown, it will grow a slightly different tree, even with the same DNA, like even with the same yeah, top, like. Okay. It'll, you know, like if there's a rock above it, it'll kind of like go this way. Yeah, um, yeah, or yeah. if there's not enough sunlight, it won't get as big. Like there's all these different ways that it could kind of go wrong, basically. Mm -hmm. um, because it's uh, even if it has that little plan at the beginning, it's going to try to just live in any way that it possibly can. And so that's sort of what asking what asking for that summary is. You're 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 taking some chances that it'll grow like a different kind of tree than you think it will. Got um, it. Can I pause you there? Is it fair to like the way I think about how that's working is that chat GPT Claude, they like scrape the internet off of a bunch of data and mm -hmm. maybe no bad parts is uh, copy protected. So they can't actually get the real text of the book. Mm -hmm. And so they've gone to like blog posts and Reddit and chat forums. And they've kind of like yeah. basically tried to piece together what the book's about. Mm -hmm. Is that like in a very loose way how it might work for a book summary? Sort of, but like the book, like let's say that No Bad Parts was on the internet, for example. Okay. Um, the book doesn't exist somewhere in ChatGPT in, in ChatGPT's brain. Like it doesn't actually like have the text somewhere that it can refer to. Mm -hmm. Um. So, and, and we, this is like sort of a rabbit hole. So, like we can we can go down the yeah. rabbit hole if you want to go. Um. But let's uh, let's skim the surface of the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> so more more or less like. What ChatGPT knows is the statistical relationships between sentences uh, or, or yeah. words in a sentence. So it knows um, if you say no bad parts by, it's going to kind of um, be able to know that very likely, commonly, the name uh, Dick Schwartz comes up. Sometimes yeah. it's Richard. Sometimes yeah. it's Dick. Um, it's, uh... And then there are other things that it could, that it could do too. But like... Um, it's it's basically doing probabilities on the on the last word that you said. So basically, okay. it's like no bad parts by, and then it will fill in dick, right? Okay. Um, and then it will take that output and put it back into itself. And it, mm -hmm. so the new prompt is no bad parts by dick, and then it will fill in Schwartz, right? Got it. Um, the probability is high, even higher exactly. for Schwartz. Exactly. But as you know from finance, like if you start if you start um, aggregating probabilities together um the chances of things happening or sort of going off the rails get a lot hot get higher and higher and higher mm -hmm. because like there's all these different decision points that it has to make right yeah and so um so it so it 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 will basically probably output a summary of of that book if that's all if that's everywhere on the internet because like it has learned again and again that this is how people describe it but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily referring to a summary that it can then got it just regurgitate and that's sort of the danger and sort of to go back to the the analogy that i made before which is like Blitzen. you've got this acorn you're growing into into a tree you don't really know what kind of tree it's going to end up being even if the dna of the acorn is the same it'll look look different in lots of different scenarios and that's when you just have a little prompt to like summarize this book um, but if you instead take the text of the book so if you have the text of no bad parts, and you put it into the prompt, um, what you get out is much more likely to be actually what um, actually like accurate and and much less likely to be hallucinated because you're not growing a tree from an acorn. It's a little bit more like taking you gave it the tree. 
Yeah. Or maybe you're, you're just like taking um, lemons and you're squeezing it into lemonade, right? Like you, okay. you have all of the basic ingredients that are there. They're like set. Yeah. They're like in the prompt. And then you're just kind of get the lemon, the lemon essence out of it. And Got there's it. a lot less room for stuff to go wrong. Um, Got it. And so, uh, so generally, if you're, if you want to get accurate responses, putting as much information in the context window is, is the best way to go. And that's why context windows being longer is so valuable because um, you can it. put more stuff in there and you can get more accurate responses. Got it. I would love uh, on this point of using, you know, I know you're an avid reader, you're an avid writer. Describe some ways that you use these models to assist slash supplement your reading process. Lots of ways. I think like a, a really big one. Um, I think that these models are incredibly good for helping you read actively, especially read actively like difficult books. So an easy one is uh, I was reading Moby Dick recently, um, okay. which is great, I'd but I never read it before. And if you have read Moby Dick or tried or read an English class, like what you'll what you'll know is it's not written in like modern English, right? So yeah. there's all these like, phrases and stuff that like you don't I don't really know or there's all these mm -hmm. references, even if it's it is in English, like they're saying they're they're referring to things that I just don't have context for because like I'm not like a I'm not like an English professor. And so typically you'd have to like read Moby Dick in class to like really understand it. But what I was doing is I would just like take a passage that I didn't understand. I'd take a picture of it, send it to ChatGPT, and I'd be like, can you just translate this into modern English? And it would like just give me like a really great explanation that would just like click into my head. Um, yeah. Another thing that it does is um, is it's really good at uh, if you take a picture of a passage and then say like, hey, can you draw this? It will like create a picture. So I have all these like scenes from Moby Dick that like I can actually like look at and it creates wow. a much more engaging reading experience. And I think the same thing is true for other types of books. Like that's more about reading fiction better, but for nonfiction, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of types of nonfiction. Like for, for me, like I love reading like dense philosophy books and, mm -hmm. um, I'm not like I majored in philosophy in, in college, but like, I'm not like a call. I'm not like a PhD level philosophy person. And some of this stuff like really probably requires a PhD to understand. And, I've always been like, well, maybe I'll like, maybe I'll go back and, and get it so that I can like understand some of this stuff. But like, actually I can just, just paste it into ChatGPT and be like, what do they mean by this? And the answers are like really good. So like I'm wow. getting way more out of the books that I want to read than I was before, especially for books that are like sort of above my reading level Yeah, <laughs> uh, for yeah. lack of a better word. And I That's think that that makes me a much better writer too, because what what it, it makes many more ideas accessible to me, and I can feel much more confident about talking about those ideas because mm. I have this partner to explain it to me that I like more or less trust. Yeah, and that's really yeah. cool. That is cool. We did a book club on Brothers Dostoevsky. It's a similar thing. It was like, what Brothers the hell Karazov. is happening? Not uh, Brothers Kar Karazov. Like, yeah. what the hell is happening in this scene or section? And one thing and I always question the hallucinations but I, i'm like tell me what happened in this chapter without mm -hmm. telling without ruining what happens like without yeah. any spoilers and it's actually pretty good like i did that with some popular tv shows like peaky blinders and stuff yeah and it, it's actually it, it, it's uh it's pretty good at it so i love yeah. that are you uploading the entire book often it depends so like depends. It depends on the kind of question i have and like what yeah. kind of book it is like for something like um, Dostoevsky writing, like you know, that book is so popular and, and yeah. it's been and in, it's the, in public the public domain. domain. For, yeah, yeah it's in the public domain. So like, it's more likely to be accurate. It won't be necessarily accurate down to like the page level, but if you ask something about like generally something that happened, it will probably yeah. know the answer. Um, for other things, I just upload upload the book. Um, it, Got yeah, it. But it really depends. So like for example, I don't. I tried to read No Bad Parts, and I just I didn't enjoy it. I, don't, I didn't like the way it was written, uh, but I want the message. Should I buy it on Kindle and then upload it? Like logistically, how would that even work for? Yeah. For a so book like that? I I cannot endorse this um, okay. because I think it's illegal. But um, if you wanted to do that kind of thing, like I think Amazon is going to come out with a language model to do this on Kindle, and okay. like the fact that they haven't is like a severe travesty so what i recommend you do is buy the book um and mm -hmm. maybe take some screenshots and throw it into chat gpt if you want to do like the full book text which i definitely do not endorse because it's 
probably illegal. There are yep. certain websites where you can download the text Darn. of the book as a text file and then upload it. And Got I really it. only, uh, and if you're going to do that, which I don't recommend, you should definitely pay for the book um, yep. as well. Um, but yeah, for now, that's just Got the it. sort of like workaround that, that people it. have to do. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, I'd love to pivot us because I'm trying to think of a, a, a use case for like consultants, finance people, maybe like industry research there are right? so like your many. boss what's that there's so many i i can so many. Just, i can just like go i can you go can, for days on this here's okay. a good one what oh yeah, yeah. all right you you give me you give me a, a great one that maybe like can transcend a few let like me give you private good. equity fundamental investing i'm going to give you a private equity one that's the, that's where okay. i'm going Perfect. so we work we work with with some with some of these types of firms and one of the most interesting things that i've seen recently is um using um gpts to negotiate so particularly if you have to have negotiations with vendors or um with p potential clients or whatever and you have a large organization of people some of whom can't necessarily don't necessarily know all of the like negotiation tactics you can create a custom version of ChatGPT or a prompt or whatever that um has all of the best principles of how you think people should negotiate um, so that when people are in negotiations with vendors, they can just throw the like email chain in there and it will recommend a next step. And your, your, sorry, your, um, you know, the team that's doing that, the person that's doing that is like instantly a much better negotiator than they would have been wow. previously. And people are doing this and it, it actually kind of works, <laughs> which is wild. Wow. Um, it and is so wild. I put, so I think that like the general principle to to be aware of is like um, these tools allow you to take the um, the taste and the decision making capacity and the pattern recognition and the experience of whoever is sort of at the top and push it down to different nodes of the organization it's so that name. they can execute on that um, yeah. without having to necessarily like do new trainings or constantly repeat it or constantly be the one who's asked the question um, yeah. because you can create these tools that where the, the, the decision-making criteria or the taste, all that stuff is explicit because it's laid out in a prompt. Good, um, good. So it can be updated and then um, people can use it without having to like necessarily know everything about it or have it have to be as skilled in it as the person at the top who wants them to do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's like a really, really powerful thing for any kind of any organization, basically. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. As you said that, I was thinking, I'm like, what are the components of negotiate? Like, you, you know, like you'd have to understand like the components of negotiation or like, like aggressive, not aggressive, walk away tactics, like things like right? it's just an interesting way. It's like, wait, I don't even know my own negotiation style. So how could I? ask chat GPT to codify it, but then there's a huge benefit of knowing my negotiating styles and then scaling it. That's the really interesting so, thing is like, yeah. first of all, there are resources. So you could take a book and just be like, well, this is, this is our book that we use or whatever. But the other thing is, yeah, like, uh, to run a company effectively, you often are in this engaged in this process of taking something that's intuitive for you and then turning yeah. it into a set yeah. of like rules um, that you yeah. can hand to someone else and they can do. And the rules and then, never actually embody the the entire all the instructions, but they're sort of like directional, so people can kind of like get it get get the sense, get the hang of it. You know, yeah. like when you say the word "be aggressive," like that might mean something totally different to you yeah. than it means to me. But like culturally, you you like write it down, and then everyone embodies it to to the to a degree that like mm -hmm. new hires sort of like learn it. And so what ChatGPT does is a like it can it can act on that be be aggressive directive, um, but but even before that it can help you take what is intuitive to you and turn it into that set of rules. So if you like, for example, went to ChatGPT and you're like, I want you to help me pull out my negotiating principles. Um, here's uh, here's a negotiating situation and here's what I did. It will give right. give you rules. Or if you're like, yeah. I want you to interview me to like help me find Ooh. out how I negotiate and put me right, in different right. situations, it will do that too. And yeah. I think that's really, really interesting is like, you know, the rule book for how a company operates, the company handbook, like has like right, basically like 1% of like what actually people do in the <laughs> company. 
Um, and mostly there's no nuance in it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly it's this sort of like intuitive pattern recognition, black magic culture thing that, um, is never actually written down and is passed from person to person, which is great. But like, I think what AI allows you to do is to some degree, make some of that culture stuff actually explicit. Um, and then be able to operationalize it without having to necessarily re- retrain everybody and power people up who, who mm-hmm. you know, for whatever reason, their skills, they can't quite yet embody the negotiating yeah. position that you want them to embody. Mm-hmm. Now they have like a partner that can help them do that. And yeah. whenever you change your style, if you're like, I want to go from being very aggressive to less aggressive, you also just don't necessarily have to variable. retrain yeah. people. You can just yeah. change the prompt. Yeah. And that's really cool. Wow. You're describing this in kind of like an organizational wide yeah. love, like a culture manual or, or set of, you know, operating principles for a firm. Um, well, obviously without naming name names, but like our companies actually, cause I think of, uh, chat GPT almost like a, like a calculator, like a bunch of people are using a calculator and some are really, you know, or maybe Excel, like some people are like Excel savants. Other people use Excel for like simple math and some people like still whip out like a pen and paper. But I view it as kind of this like very fragmented in, in, individual contributor like uh, enhancer uh, pro- program. Are, have you seen organizations that have kind of put uh, AI at kind of at a kind of a central node within an organization? I mean, I think kind it's, of like, hap- it's sort you- of happening all the time. It's still like very early days, but I think... Um, you know, like, I don't know. I think, I think it was like Moderna or something just came out with a case study of how they like implemented like 400 different custom GPTs for different parts of their organization and it like skyrocketed mm. their, their organizational effectiveness. So I think there are a lot of people who are doing this. I think it's a little harder at the like huge company level um, yeah. to like get it done effectively. But I mean, I know even for us, like um, that's a big priority for me is like, yeah identifying like all of the things that we're doing repeatedly and like building little tools that can help us like do that faster at a higher level of quality. Mm -hmm. Not, not necessarily because like we don't want to hire people, but like, yeah, I have infinite amounts of people. Yeah. I have like infinite amounts of work to do. And so like getting, getting some of the drudgery tasks done more quickly helps us do other interesting, more creative stuff, which is really cool. And, and yeah, like having to sort of codify, like what does good look like? Yeah. So that it can go in, into a prompt is a really useful exercise and having it be accessible to anyone in the organization mm-hmm. so anyone can do it is really great. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that. And and so let's, I love the, the more like philosophical question in terms of, you know, AI is going to eat jobs and, and, and so on. Maybe like a, a more toned down version of that question is, do you have a sense of the types of work that AI is already eating up from physical labor? Um, I think like one of the things that we've sort of touched on and and I think you've said without like saying it in as many words is um, AI is quite good at taking a um, uh, existing set of information and then compressing it down into a into into a new form. Um, So that's taking an essay and turning it into a, a headline. Or take okay, in cool. my case, taking a podcast and turning it into a tweet, or uh, taking a, a book. book and then asking a question about the book and finding the answer mm-hmm. to, the, to the question. Like all that stuff is like you can just think about it as taking a big bunch of text and then smushing it down into like a really small compression yeah. that uh, that is for a specific purpose. Yeah, and there's one like kind of modifier on that, which is the kinds of compressions that it's good for are ones that it has already seen. Um, so where it's, you're doing those kinds of things a lot, or someone else has been doing those things a lot. So, and every, we take articles and turn them into into headlines all the time. Right. So it's seen that before and it can do that pretty well. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I think, um, if you're thinking about like what kinds of tasks are likely to be replaced by AI or what kind of jobs like are likely to change, um, or maybe go away, um, looking at the world as, okay, how are we, like, where am I doing, like, these sort of um, simple, repetitive com- compressions of existing information into new forms mm-hmm. um, without really adding much new stuff? 
uh, yeah. and, and doing it in a way that's like pretty much the same every time, that stuff is going to be very different in a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Yeah. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, God, it would be so great in our organization to have like an AI nerd that just kind of turns over all the rocks and like sits in the meetings and like, I can't believe, you know, like there's probably so many, like in one point, it's kind of like the manager thing. I don't have time to train the person yeah. to do it. So I just do it myself. But I like, we're a writer, like, you know, I'm writers and so much of our work is, you know, like creating the one big piece and like turning into lots of different small yeah. pieces across like an infinite number of formats. Yeah. Like that's the kind of like a prime AI type task. And so yeah. I, I do feel like there, there, there's an opportunity, uh, uh, there, there's an opportunity there. And I, I would like, as you're saying, I, was like, I would like pay an AI consultant to be like, shadow us, come like, let us da- like inter- kind of like uh, how you would hire McKinsey or, you know, yeah. interview all of our people, find out the biggest pain points, the bottlenecks, the, rep- the repeatable things, and then show us how to implement it or implement it yourself. Like, I, I feel like, and I think as the CEO, like as a, of a one, two person plus contractor company, like the, it's probably me that should be doing that yeah. <laughs> right now. And, and I do view this as a bit of a, a challenge, uh, a friendly challenge from you, even though you explicitly said it, or like that's. That's the vibe that, that that I get it. And you've got me very excited about that. So um, awesome. is, is that, how do you think of that frame? I think it's great. I mean, we literally do that like for companies. Um, oh, wow. So we have not, we have not announced this yet and we'll do like a formal announcement um, oh, cool. probably in the next, I don't know, month or this so. This wasn't orchestrated people. <laughs> in question. Oh, we've already started to do that, um, which is yep, like, okay. a, we just get a lot of these, a lot of questions of people being like, can you come in and like, figure out how we're doing things like what, you know, where are the opportunities to use this inside the organization, help us implement it, help us train. I think actually a lot of people are like, we've tried this, but like it's no one's job to do it. And so it sort of falls by the wayside. And so we need someone else to come in and help. Um, and so that's been, that's been really good. There's a lot of, we're working with a lot of cool companies and it's been really fun and um cool. and i'm learning a lot too because like i just get to see what works and what doesn't in, in a lot yeah. of different places and that's been that's been really cool i could talk to you for for hours but my last my last question uh and I, you're like i retract my opening statement of solution <laughs> <in turn. laughs> i had a suspicion that i would but i, I, I retract it <laughs> i get asked a lot by high school it's funny i'm on tiktok believe it or not and uh my best tiktok content is just like telling people about my wall street experience Mm -hmm. and it's a lot of like college and high school kids that that follow me Mm -hmm. and so someone asked me the other day i get this question a lot it's like i just graduated high school and i like what skills should i like i'm going to a traditional four-year program in business Mm -hmm. and and i said to someone i was like ai but I, i didn't even know how to follow up that answer yeah and and so i love for you, if an 18 year old asks you, an 18 year old, let's say with a business degree that probably is going to get into big tech consulting or fang, mm-hmm. you know, kind of Rad Reed's avatar type trajectory. And they're like, I want to build my AI muscle. Mm-hmm. How would you coach them or advise them to pursue this very nebulous thing in my mind? Yeah. I mean, I think like, I don't know, we're just at this like really amazing like era in history where like we were all just given these like magical powers um like you and i we can code you know even if we can't code like yeah i mean i can code but like i can code way faster than i could before and way higher quality like i have people on my team who have literally built and shipped apps themselves that have no idea how to code they have no idea how it works but it's it works and we use those tools every day Mm -hmm. um you can code you can write you can draw you can make movies like the the sort of like options for what you can do yeah. are like sort of limitless and yeah. um not only that but like your powers to do that are uh getting better and better every day without yeah. you having to do anything because people release new models and so i think that the like the core thing is to recognize that that's possible recognize sort of like what that enables if you're like a creative ambitious individual and just approach it with a curious experimental attitude and just like try stuff like get inspired about stuff get curious about stuff learn about the world like use these models to do that use these models to build little things use these models to like 
I don't know, whatever, make a make research a, something, make a spreadsheet, like research yeah. something like whatever you want to do. Just do that it repeatedly is. over and over again, because I think the people who have the skills to manage the models and know how to do what with them are going to be the ones that are, you know, doing well uh, yeah. in, in this uh, what I've been calling the allocation economy. So. Yeah, I think we're like moving from a knowledge economy where you're compensated based on what you know to an allocation economy where you're compensated based on how well you can allocate at intelligence. Um, yeah. And um, so getting the skills to do that, I think, are going to be the most valuable thing you can. And the best way to do that is just be curious because like we're in this new world where like no one really knows anything like yeah. uh, everyone's and sort of on the edge. will never keep up. I mean, the blog yeah. posts can't. You guys are doing probably the best job out there. And you guys probably can't even keep up. In, in, it's in just it's like hard. It's super hard. Yeah, it's it's sort of exhausting, but it's also really exhilarating. So that's I think yeah. that's, that's my best advice because all this all the Got specific it. tactics are going to be different in six months. Yeah, um, but the, like general this general trend is going to be the same. Do you think it's fair to say like I almost and I I I I've wanted to do this and actually when I said I was going to do this, people are like just watch Dan's podcast, <laughs> uh, which we'll, we'll link in the show notes. But I think that I I need like. I exercise an hour a day. I meditate 15 to 20 minutes a day. I, I think I need a AI gym. Like I, I think I need to commit 20, 15 to 30 minutes a day to, to kind of experimenting, ideally experimenting, you know, experimenting with the things that I need to do, but like different models, like you said, um, weirder use cases, you know, because you're, you're right. I mean, I, I, I was, was going to try to get you to narrow, like, okay, they want to do investment banking. Like, well, but you're going to give me the same answer. Yeah, uh, it's like find the problem that you need to solve that you need solved or the curiosity yeah. that you need explored and like do it and then yeah. do it in as many different angles as you can and like yeah. see what happens. Right. I mean, a hundred percent. I think that's exactly how I feel. It, like if you really press me on the investment banker stuff, I think what I would say is um, ChatGPT has this feature called um, advanced data analysis or code interpreter, where if mm -hmm. you upload a spreadsheet, and you're like, okay, build a DCF. Um, it will just build one, and uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, it like it writes the Python code to interact with the spreadsheet, and then it outputs the uh, outputs the the spreadsheet or outputs the model for you. Um, so like you can ask wow. pretty much any question of a data set and like have it be answered for you um, with Code Interpreter or advanced data oh. analysis. So like that kind of thing is like, it's, cr it's crazy. It's really crazy. And if you're going to be in finance, you're going to have to use tools like this. So I would definitely try, try Wait, to it. It would create the model from scratch for you or you yeah. have to upload the model. No, it would create it from scratch. So you could say like, give me an LBO model of like, you know, yes. this, and then does it spit it out in like an X, like a dot XL, XLS file? So, uh, I, okay. I, I, say, I don't know. I don't know if it will do I don't know if it will build an XLS file for you. Okay. What it will do is it will perform the same underlying calculations that you want to, per to perform, perform in Python yeah. and then I'll, I'll put a, a CSV of the results. Um, I'm not sure about like whether it can, whether it can modify like actual XLS files or not. You'd have to, yeah. you'd have to, you'd have to check that for yourself. Yeah. Um, Part of the experimentation. But, yeah. But generally it can do really, really cool financial analysis. And there are also tools that are like built specifically for this that may actually have the like XLS stuff. Got it. Got it. You know, one thing that I'm hearing in all this is like, this is like, like the beauty of it. And what's so daunting about it is that the limits are your, is your, is your creativity. Yeah. Right. That's and great. I think that's like so fucking beautiful. But if you're kind of the person that, and I'm not totally that person, but I have that tendency that like needs like a, a lane to, to go in, it can be still, I think that's my problem. It just feels so overwhelming that like, I wish someone just like gave me a lane and it's like, go in that lane and go. And, and I think you've given me one. It's like, figure out how to improve your writing using Claude. I think that's, that's the lane that I want to go. That's the takeaway I have from, from this, for me personally, um, and see where that, that takes you. Do that and then try out the advanced data analysis stuff because I think you'll Got really it. like it. I think it'll make your brain go boom. So, yeah. Dan, I mean, always a pleasure. Tell us where we can get you and Every's uh, wisdom and we'll link it in the show notes in the description. Super fun. Uh, really great to hang. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Dan Shipper and uh, you can uh, subscribe to Every at every.to. And the podcast is called how do you use ChatGPT? On YouTube, right? No, no Spotify, right? 
It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple That's Podcasts. Fun. Anywhere you get podcasts, you can get it. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. This has been priceless. Thank you.